Good to see you back for the second part of my conversation with Philippe Perret. He's the CEO of Fox E-Mobility about electric vehicles, the market, the go-to market strategy, and why electric vehicles could be a solution for the long run. The car is a perfect fit as a commercial vehicle. Um, so, you know, um, because of the pandemic, also the home delivery services are just booming. And the last mile delivery is a very hot uh, market. And our car will fit perfectly all the needs of any company uh, acting in this sector uh, of the last mile delivery. When it comes to the connectivity, before going into the B2B target market, mm -hmm. the connectivity, I get more and more the impression that we don't have cars anymore that happen to have a little bit of electronics inside. But I feel that we have, we are driving computers with wheels. A uh, computer with wheels, yeah. That's, uh, yeah, that's uh, what, uh, what Tesla uh, bring, um, uh, brought to the market, huh? Yeah, and that's, um, that's it. So basically, we have to have a plug-and-play situation in the car as well. Yeah, that's that sure. So, and and of course, it will be it will be on our car. So, uh, in fact, you you have a car, but you need to integrate the right software in order to be able to integrate your own device on it. Uh, and as I said, so uh, uh, you have Android or you are you you have uh, Apple. So you will be able to integrate your own device in the car and to have a fully connected car. So uh, if not, nobody will buy your car. So that's for sure. No, yeah, absolutely. No, you can't be on another planet just because you're in the car. <laughs> you know, FOMO is definitely but, taking over. <laughs> because you're, you're home, you're totally connected. And when you go out and you take your car, you want to be as well connected as if you're sitting home. And that's a, that's a clear requirement of the clientele on the B2C segment. That's yes, absolutely. Especially if you stay in the city. Of course, you might not want to be connected if you're going out up in the hills and you know you want to go tr uh, trooping in nature, then you might not be. But for this particular segment, for this particular niche that Mia is really delivering and serving to, it's a different picture. Okay, B2B. You know, I come from the business side and always think, okay, so what, what businesses would buy into Mia 2.0? What sort of business would I have to run to be interested to build up a fleet with you? Yeah, I, um, so the, the car is a perfect fit as a commercial vehicle. Um, so, so, you know, um, because of the pandemic, also the home delivery services are just booming. And the last mile delivery is a very hot uh, market. And our car will fit perfectly all the needs of any company uh, acting in this sector uh, of the last mile delivery. It's, it's a small car, but has plenty of space inside. It's affordable for a company, so it's also important to, uh, to try to, 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 to get the, the cost as low as possible. And for all these reasons, so um, I, I'm sure we are going to get any um, 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 a lot of uh, clients in this B2B segment buying the car uh, for all these uh, reasons. So who are you targeting? Something like Uber Eats or your local pizza delivery chain? So, it's, so it, it it can be the the craftsman uh, walking in the in, inside the city who, who needs a lot of uh, space uh, behind the seat for all the tools he has to transport every day. But of of course, all the delivery um, um, uh, apps, uh, the the delivery room, uh, So it's not the same same name in in in, uh, in 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 France. But all these companies and all the big supermarkets who are now delivering the, the food uh, home in the different places inside the city. And uh, they need to have a small car, which is agile in the city. And the fact to have a central seat position and with sliding doors uh, will be very convenient for the one delivering home because it can park in very narrow position. Uh, it can exit on the left, exit on the right, and he has a plenty of space behind. So that's a perfect fit. And of course, with an affordable price. 
Yeah. But what about, I'm just thinking about delivery and the weight. And one of the big issues and disadvantages, what the batteries have in electric vehicles, and hence also the question of range, is the heavier the car, the quicker the battery runs out because, of course, it needs more energy to get ahead yeah. in the first place. So where does the 200 kilometers uh, stops to be valid if you start really using it in the B2B segment? So um, uh, so we, we, we have been reading the different surveys uh, for the uh, last mile delivery and all these companies delivering home are in an average in a day using between 80 and 100 kilometer every day. Uh, of course, with 200 kilometer, we are answering the, the, the question and uh, the car fits to the needs of this last mile delivery. But on top of this, we have a patent and uh, it's possible for us to include a second battery if needed. So let's say we have a fleet asking us, so 200 kilometers, perhaps it's, um, it's not enough. We need extra range uh, because we drive more than 200 kilometers a day. So then for a price option, uh, we have the possibility to include in our car a second battery allowing uh, uh, 400 to 450 kilometers. So we have, the, we have the answer even if the client requires uh, uh, a bigger range. Let me quickly interrupt the conversation to say thank you that you are here with me on the channel. If you do enjoy what I'm putting out, the in-depth kind of conversations, then why don't you subscribe and also hit the bell button so I can keep you informed with our newest releases. Thanks for that in advance and let's get back to the conversation. Okay, it's additional cost. On the other hand, you have uh, you said there's margin on both sides. You can either yeah, buy another battery or, you know, the actual use of your kilometers is not 200, but it's 100. So you still have that option to use that in terms of weight, right? Exactly. Okay. And, and the car with 900 kilometers will be also very fun to drive because, again, so with a, uh, even with a battery of a 25 kilowatt hour, because the car is so light, so it will be very fun to drive, which is also perhaps not for the B2B, but for the B2C market, it will be, of course, very important. And that's the reason why we want our client to test drive the car, uh, because they will see that we are, we are talking about a real car, uh, a very nippy car. Yes, I wonder if I floor my Mia 2.0, whether I can kind of like leave the Porsche behind me simply because I don't weigh anything. Uh, <laughs> you, 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 won't be, you won't be the last one on the road, uh, on the red light. That's, that's, that's a clear, oh, no. that's a clear <laughs> Yeah, unless it stores, goes like, mm. <laughs> it dies on us. Well, battery, let, let's stick with this one. And I, I have to ask you that, Philippe, of course, you know, I'm... Um, I'm very much a fuel cell girl. I believe in that in that um, technology going forward, also for for vehicles and not only the forklifts, but in general. Uh, a lot of criticism comes from the battery, the production of it, and also the waste management of the battery. So the uh, front end and the back end, let's say, of the fantastic uh, performance potentially of an electric vehicle, and also the CO2 emission targets. Tell us um, how are EV companies going around this? So first of all, we have the obligation uh, to recycle the battery, to take back the battery at the end of the life cycle of the car. And, um, and then you have two options. Either you give it to the uh, supplier, uh, which has the capacity to take from the battery the parts uh, is interested in uh, for building a new battery, or you have to give it to a company like Unicor, for instance, in Germany, who is uh, recycling the battery. And this is a cost that we already included, of course, in our business plan. In because we have, the, we have the obligation to do it. Yes, okay. So that is, that is kind of managed, but somehow outsourced, like Mia is also outsourced in terms of the supply chain. You also can give back. Exactly. So either the supplier is taking it back or we have to give it and we pay for this uh, to a unicorn who is uh, recycling the battery at the end. Yeah. And we're going to look at, uh, you know, zero CO2 emission cars. And it seems that Mia is one of those. And that brings me uh, to the question of your revenue pillars. Where, where, what are the real revenue drivers? I mean, I just read a report where Sir James Dyson, you know, the one with the Hoovers, Dyson, he invested a lot of money in electric vehicles and he just left it. He said, it's never going to be commercial, commercially viable. So he left it. What makes you so convinced that you're actually going to make money? 
Yes, we are going to make money. So I told you about the price. We are going to sell this car for 16,000 euros, including VAT. And only on, on this um, the core pillar, uh, which is selling cars in Europe, so cars produced in Europe, by the way, so we are also a European answer to all these big US and Chinese manufacturers who try also to enter the European market in our segment. But this um, pillar, um, usual pillar of selling cars, will be already profitable by itself because this 150 million euros were already invested in the past, because we are going to have a very lean structure with outsourcing the production to third-party manufacturers. Um, and uh, for all these reasons, the first pillar will be profitable. And also, sorry, I forgot that uh, um, the sales organization will be mainly on internet, which is uh, saving us a lot of cost. You know that currently with the traditional cars, 20 to 25 percent of the global price of the car is connected with uh, retail, with uh, the sales organization, so marketing and sales uh, costs. And if you can avoid this cost, of course, uh, this will benefit the client. And I think the client don't want to pay 20 or 25 percent for the sales organization currently. Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, coming back to the pillar, so the first pillar is selling cars in Europe and being profitable already on this pillar. But we have two additional revenues sources. So the second one is that outside Europe, we are going to sell licenses uh, to a partner. Uh, for instance, in Southeast Asia, uh, um, uh, we find a partner and this partner for each car produced on the name of Mia will pay to us a royalty for each car, uh, which is roughly 3% of the value of the car. And this is additional revenue and additional margin because in front of these royalties, you don't have any costs. And the third pillar, and that's, a, uh, that's a also a window of opportunity, um, uh, currently we are producing zero emission car because this is an electric car, and we get um, CO2 credits. And this is CO2 credits, we can sell them to the manufacturers who are, which are not respecting uh, the emission, uh, the CO2 emission regulation in Europe, which is to respect 95 grams of CO2 for each kilometer. And I think the best example, I'm sure a lot of your auditors know it, that uh, a Tesla is making almost all of his, revenue, uh, of his margin sorry, from the sale of CO2 credits. And last year they sold, it's a public number, 1.8 billion euro, uh, no, dollars, 1.8 billion dollars to a Fiat Chrysler. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a huge amount. And... Uh, concerning our and, Mia, and if, I may, if I may say so, and the rest of the, <laughs> their money uh, comes in through government subsidies. Go, go, government subsidies and um, and um, concerning our Mia um, uh, in 23, we 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 could sell our CO2 credits for 4,000 euro each car, uh, which is not something we integrated in our business plan because we want to show investors that we are profitable on the core business, which is selling car in Europe, so the normal business. But we have a huge opportunity with a license business and also a huge opportunity with selling the CO2 credits to the one who are not respecting the CO2 emission regulation. Yeah, and even though that regulation may get tougher from 95 now, maybe down to 50, maybe down to 30, you still have enough margin because you're is zero. Well, I think, you know, being an investor myself, I'd be, I'd be quite happy to push this advantage as an additional revenue stream, simply because we are who we are in our DNA as a guaranteed kind of income, because until the rest of the, the other producers are being caught up to these targets and even come below or kind of follow the lower targets going forward, there is a lot of money to be made, I guess, for your company in general. But quickly, uh, coming back to the license business, Sounds great to get royalties without any cost. My question is about the quality control because it's your name out there. It's Fox. It's Mia 2.0. You know, you want to make sure that whoever produces in license your brand upholds to certain standards because you have global ambition. You need to scale globally 
at a certain reputational level, don't you? Yeah, sure. We and uh, so uh, uh, when I say uh, no cost, so it's uh, it's exaggerated, of course. So we are uh, we are we are having perhaps two or three engineers which are going to be responsible for checking the quality of what the partner outside Europe is going to produce because you're totally right. We are, uh, it's our reputation, it's our name, it's our brand, and we don't want to have any damage uh, if, if the partner is not working exactly as we wanted to do. And so we, are, we will have for each country um, uh, two or three people uh, um, in charge of um, verifying the quality of the job done by the partner outside Europe. Mm -hmm. And you've emphasized, emphasized a lot that you're a European brand, you're a European car, yeah. you, source, you source from Europe. Yes. Uh, and that brings me, of course, to the entire supply chain. That is one thing, to outsource. And you are very flexible, hence also that great opportunity that you can offer online. You, you don't ne necessarily have to have showrooms. You can mm -hmm. have demo days or pop-up stores, which leans down this kind of cost. But still, competition is out there, and they are smart, and they are big like, for example, China and the U.S. Mm. Um, how, are, how is Fox dealing with it conceptually right now to really come along a long way, even though China is going to go into the small segment maybe faster than your average European car brand because of their urban situation? Yeah, that's the reason why we need to be very quick because this window of opportunity I, I explained before won't last forever. Competition will come in our segments, that's for sure. And we need to establish our brand uh, in 23, 24, take market share uh, and uh, keep um, a very slim structure. And um, that's the reason why we are outsourcing the production. That's the reason why we don't want to carry huge overhead costs for the sales organization in order to stay very slim, very lean, and, uh, and being able to make a margin even by offering a car at 16,000 euros. So what is the low-hanging fruit if you say Europe is your first target market or around your home turf of Germany? So, for, for, so the main countries in Europe will be Germany, France, uh, Switzerland, that's for sure. But um, also the countries in, in, um, in Southern Europe, uh, because something, uh, another um, USP, so unique selling point of the car, is that we have a, a, a flat roof on, on the car. And it's possible for us to install solar cells on top of the roof. And uh, this is not only a gadget, and uh, because with this uh, additional cells on the roof, you can increase your range by 15% just by letting your car on the parking when on a on a sunny day. Uh, uh, which is uh, for you, uh, Patricia, you're afraid uh, to stay uh, <laughs> to <laughs> to stay outside and not to have the possibility to recharge. So only with the sun, so the car will be able to go or to drive to the next plug. Hopefully I, also during the night. Uh, and, <laughs> and did, that's more difficult during the night. <laughs> more so, difficult. You know, I absolutely love it. And, you know, uh, Philippe, I, I looked at, um, you know, what are the most EV populated countries? Uh, Norway is number one. And yeah. it's interesting how they actually put out this, um, this statistic. So Norway has one electric vehicle per 19 people. Yeah, mm -hmm. so 19 people, one electric vehicle. After that, followed by US, 47 people, one electric vehicle. Iceland, 73. So the gaps go get quite uh, quite bigger. And then Sweden. And the worst is actually close by. So Turkey, 55,000 people, one electric vehicle. Followed by Greece, 19,000 people, one electric vehicle. Poland, 10,000, and so on. So I guess there's quite a bit of scope within your near vicinity as well. Yeah, clear answer. I think the answer to these numbers is the infrastructure, infra the, the charging infrastructure. Yeah. Uh, because in Norway, you have just a great infrastructure. We will have a great infrastructure in, in Germany and France. But of course, in some countries in Europe, they don't have this infrastructure. And uh, we are coming to the main concern of people, why they don't buy an electric car? Because they are afraid not to be able to recharge. And if you have the infrastructure, of course, in a country, it's much easier to sell a lot of electric cars because people will think, okay, I don't have any problem with charging my battery. But of course, today in Greece, in Turkey, um, uh, and mainly in the Southern Europe, unfortunately, the infrastructure is weaker than in Northern Europe.
Yeah, so it's almost B2G, business to government that you have to look at and get these yeah. governments to you know, invest in that infrastructure in order to have your business model take off in general, not just uh, for Fox, yeah. but for yeah. all of them. Yeah, no, no, it's an interesting one. Okay, well, let's start to conclude our conversation, Philippe, which I enjoyed very much. I definitely learned a lot through my research and what you were saying. Um, we talked about the challenges. We talked about the opportunities. But I would like to know, you having been involved in MIA 1.0, now um, just about to launch uh, MIA 2.0, talking to investors, doing the market research, what are the key learnings you've actually taken away personally as somebody who is really looking at a disruptive um, product? I don't want to say technology because we've had it for a while. Product on one hand, and also as a manager, what were the main issues you learned? So uh, first of all, the um, uh, talking with investors, so they say that we um, we have the right product on the right timing. I think they're totally convinced that we are going to fill a gap in this segment where um, uh, not so much competition is currently playing. Um, they um, they gave us the feedback that we we could gather a great management team because you don't have any success with your story. Even if you have a good product on the right timing, if you don't have the good management. And um, so I'm not alone on, the, on this uh, story. Uh, even uh, as a CEO, I have uh, two great um, um, uh, colleagues um, with uh, more than 50 years together experience in the automobile uh, industry of Deutsch, <laughs> in, German, uh, in Germany, uh, responsible for electrifying all the fleets of uh, Porsche and, or Mercedes. And um, so we can prove to investors that we have the capacity to build this car, to organize the facelift and to build this car. Uh, and, um, uh, and they also feel that we have the right strategy in order to sell it, because uh, selling through internet organizing the pop-up stores. That's exactly what they want to hear. Uh, because if not, you cannot compete with the big ones who have this uh, retailer or um, uh, stores all around Europe. And um, um, so I think, so. but on the other side, uh, Mia is not, is not an um, uh, established mark today. Yep. And, and of course, they, they are asking, so how confident are you that you are going to be able to, uh, to sell 50,000 cars by 23, which is our target, or to sell 100,000 cars in 24? And the answer to this we are giving to them is that uh, these figures uh, represent roughly between 6 and 10 percent of the market share in 23 and 24. B because when we organize our business plan, we said, okay, what will be the market in this A segment, B2C and B2B in 23 and 24. And we came with numbers so um, um, because the market is booming. But, and, uh, and we said, okay, what is the market share? We will be able, being very cautious, to take from this uh, cake in 23, 24. And, um, and um, we, our numbers represent in 23, 6% of the market and in 24, 10% of the market. Mm. And how much does that then depend on really the government subsidies continuing in terms of the incentives for the buyers, but also the money be being put into infrastructure? And so I, I, I think this is a, an, an additional help if the government is still uh, playing. But um, even, let's say we don't have any subsidies, uh, Patricia, and the car is sold for 16,000 euros. Uh, so it's a very affordable price for a real car, sustainable uh, with a lot of, so I want to give uh, all the uh, selling points again. Um, um, of course, if the price is not 1600 and with a subsidy and only 10,000 or 8,000, it will be even easier to sell to the clients. But even with 16,000, uh, I'm sure the car won't be sold um, uh, for 16,000 in, um, uh, in one shot. And the um, uh, banks will offer, so leasing uh, capacities, we make some calculation, and it will be able, will be able to propose a car for 60 to 70 euro a month mm -hmm. on, a on, a, on, on a leasing package. Yeah. Uh, 
So it's perhaps something comparable to a, to an iPhone, uh, <laughs> uh, and of course with this with this pricing we will uh, get a lot more of customers because again today what are people saying? They are saying I I I I I I'm not able to buy an electric car because they see prices above thirty thousand euro. Uh, and but proposing 16,000 euro uh, will, uh, I, I, I'm sure, decide a lot of new customers to come to EV vehicles. Yes, and have a look at it in the first place. And I guess one thing is the pricing. The other one is, of course, as you were saying, having an established brand. And then uh, last time we talked, you actually said, you know, Mia One, we produced, what was it, uh, 2,000 or 1,800 vehicles and yeah. 1,200 are still there and they are dear collector items and they are working. They are they are actually... We have a fan club. We have a big fan club in France. So <laughs> well, enthusiastic about the car. So the, the, the car was just uh, innovative and people are happy to drive this car and the feedback we have from our customers. And that's also um, what we can bring to the investors. We are not starting from zero. We are not a startup because we can give them all this background from the history. The car is secure. We can prove it because of, uh, of the 10 years experience. We can prove that the cars are still driving around. A lot of cars of the Mia one, they have more than 300,000 kilometers. Well, it's on more the, than on, I can on the, say about mine. <laughs> on, 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 on the clock, and that's it driving. And if you want to buy them now, you still pay fifteen thousand euro to the uh, to the uh, on the retail on the retail market. You have to pay fifteen thousand euro for this car. Well, there you go. Even a long term market value, yeah. never mind being ten years old. Yeah. Philippe, fantastic. Thank you so much for this conversation. Really insightful in the entire kind of EV market, its trajectory. You know the do's, the don'ts, the challenges. But really, it seems it is buoyant. There's a lot of money going in, be it from the government, the producers, also those people that are actually the consumers believing in its cool to be environmentally friendly, not just to be cool for the sake of whatever you sacrifice on the other side. So thank you so much for our conversation today, Philippe. Thank you so much. And thank you, dear Mintory TV community, for having joined us yet again for a fantastic conversation, this time with, with Philippe Perret. He is the CEO of Fox Mobility. I'll see you soon and stay curious. Bye. <laughs>